talk of the day is Camille Hodé, who's going to be talking about abstract commentators and some normal circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, thank you organizers, for having me here. It's been a great week so far. Um, so, so my talk is really uh, we said a natural sequel to uh, Joanna's talk before. Um, so in Joanna's talk, we talked about uh, symmetries or dimorphisms of some normal subgroups of the mapping testers on the surface. And we saw that in certain situations you have uh, rigidity, meaning that certain normal subgroups of the mapping class group have uh, no other automorphisms than the natural ones given by conjugation by uh, an element in the mapping class group. And uh, in my talk, I'm, I'm going to uh, try to tackle the similar questions for normal subgroups of um, our effort. So this is all joint work with Martin Bright's and Eric so, so let me start by recalling. The following theorem of Farben Hendel in uh, 2006, the stating that for all n at least 4, the uh, abstract commentator of R of Fn is uh, R of Fn Which means, in plain words, that if you take uh, two finite index subgroups in our Fn, then uh, any possible abstract algebraic isomorphism between those two finite index subgroups of our Fn is actually just going to be the restriction of uh, the conjugation by some element in the environment. <laughs> the restriction to H1 <coughs> of the conjugation <coughs> some element no. right so this here means that the abstract commentator of a group is just going to be uh, a set of all uh, equivalence classes of isomorphisms between two uh, finite index subgroups of G, where the equivalence relation is that you're going to identify two such uh, isomorphisms if they uh, agree on some uh, common uh, finite index subgroup of their domain. I mean, they are, they are close to fine. Right, and this turns out to actually be a group because you can compose two such isomorphisms up to restricting to uh, the right finite index subgroup of G. Right, so, so let me make a few uh, comments about this uh, theorem of Farben Hendel. Uh, the first comment is that uh, you can view this as uh, an analog of uh, most of rigidity theorem which is saying that if you take two, say, uh, irreducible lattices in a uh, uh, higher rank semi-simple Lie group, then uh, any abstract isomorphism between uh, the two lattices is actually just going to be the restriction of an isomorphism of the environment Lie group. And you also have an uh, analogous statement for uh, the magnet class group let's say, of the closed surface in the of the genus of these three, then it's a to be that. So the abstract commensurator of the mapping class group, <coughs> except in low complexity, is uh, the extending mapping class group, the one where you look for uh, orientation reversing from the mode. Um, a, a second remark is that if you let the two finite index subgroups be uh, out of n itself, then you get that every isomorphism of out of fn, every automorphism of out of fn, is just inner. In other words, uh, outer automorphism rule of out of fn is trivial, and this is something that was actually proved earlier by uh, Brighton and Bachman, I think in 2000, for n. At least three, but, but their proof was uh, heavily relying 
on studying the torsion in RFN. And as RFN has a finite index torsion free subgroup, uh, their proof didn't generalize to understanding the abstract emancipation of RFN. Notice also that this is completely false in rank 2, simply because uh, out of 2, which is the same as GL2Z, is virtually free. And so, uh, in particular, it is going to contain finite index subgroups that are free of any rank. And so, in the abstract immense rate, you get copies of uh, out of FN for, for any. And it's actually the abstract immense rate or the free group is not even finitely generated. So, so the statement is very far from being true in, in rank 2. And actually, uh, Farrell and Kendall in their paper <laughs> left the case where n is equal to 3 uh, open. Okay, so what we did is uh, we gave a, a completely new proof of Farrell and Kendall's theorem, which enabled us to generalize it in uh, various directions. So the first way in which we could generalize it is that our Proof also works in rank 3, so we can show that the abstractment rate of out of 3 is out of 3. And, and each time I write this, I should actually say that the natural inclusion map from out of 3 to the abstractment rate is a nice Right. And, and then the second uh, <coughs> kind of generalization that we have is that we are able to study the symmetries, as I said, of sort of normal subgroups of our uh, So the, the general philosophy, following uh, what Brendan and Margulitz did in the Mackin class group setting that uh, Joanna told us uh, in, in our talk, is that uh, if you pick a normal, a normal subgroup of out of Fn, which uh, is sufficiently rich in the sense that it contains, I'm going to be very vague, but just at the philosophical level for the moment, let's say sufficiently many small <laughs> automorphisms, and I'm writing small automorphisms in analogy to uh, the small magnet classes that were those uh, roughly supported on a small subsurface of the surface. So if you have a, a normal subgroup of RFN that is sufficiently rich in distance, then you would expect that... Uh, so you have a map from RFN to the abstract commensurator of H, because since H is normal, every element of RFN acts on H by the conjugation. And you would expect that this should be an isomorphism. Right, so of course, there are restrictions on the normal subgroup that you should put in this statement, because uh, as we saw in, in the magnetic network case, there is a theorem of the uh, many behind in Ossi, which tells you that if you pick an um, automorphism of uh, the free group, which is uh, fully reducible, and you should think of this as being an analog of the theory of the news of uh, neomorphism of the surface in the case of free groups, then uh, they prove that uh, up to raising phi to a power, the normal subgroup generated by phi or phi to the n is the free group, and, and therefore its abstract commensurator is far from the other. But, but somehow, this is typically not a subgroup that contains small automorphisms because you can have this normal subgroup to be purely given. And they prove this by using the WP product of fully reducible elements acting on the free factor complex of the free group, which is known to be hyperbolic. Okay, so let's look at positive results. So, what do we prove? The first thing we prove is that so n is 3 and let h 
be a, a normal subgroup of RFN such that every linear algebra automorphism, every then twist if you wish, By linearly drawing it, I mean that you pick an automorphism and if you iterate it on any element of the free group, then the length of phi to the n of g is going to grow linearly. <coughs> so it's a thing, then just. Every linearly drawing automorphism has a power contained. So here, typically, h is containing many of those small automorphisms. Then, uh, the natural map from out of n to the abstract commensurator of H is an isomorphism. <clears throat> and, and there are interesting examples of uh, normal subgroups of out of n satisfying uh, this uh, assumption. For example, it's known that if you look at the kernel of uh, the natural map from uh, out of n to the outer automorphism of the free bone side group of brain N with any exponent, positive exponent, then uh, this satisfies this system. Right? So, so this <coughs> is the group generated by N elements when we impose that uh, every element raised to the power N is trapped. But of course, so since every automorphism of our fn preserves the normal subgroup generated by n's power, every automorphism of our fn is going to induce an automorphism of this free burn side group. And so, so, so just this might as well. And its kernel is a normal subgroup of our fn that is rigid in the sense that all its symmetries come from our blocks. Sorry? Just the definition of the burn side group. Oh, yes. Thank you. <coughs> I think this is due to the fact that these are the same Okay, another interesting <coughs> normal subgroup of uh, our plan is its uh, Torelli subgroup. <coughs> and uh, here again, we can show that for all n h is 3, the abstract commensurator of the Torelli subgroup of RFN <laughs> is on right to this. This kernel of the natural <coughs> map from uh, RFN to DNZ given by just passing to give you the Okay, and then you can ask about uh, further terms in the Johnson filtration of RFN, and they all satisfy the same uh, thing. So here you can prove it for n at least 4. So if you look at the kernel of the natural morphism from RFN to outer automorphism group of the free Newtonian group of class K then it's abstract commentary so these are the terms in the Johnson filtration right so there are many interesting normal subgroups of outer and for which we can prove that the abstract commentary is uh, our and, and somehow you should think that all these groups contain, in a sense, sufficiently many linear, linear drawing automorphisms that we need in the proof to make uh, those work. <coughs> okay, so my, my plan for the rest of my talk is to actually uh, explain you our proof of uh, theorem one, uh, meaning explain you. Our new proof of our Kendall's theorem in the case where n is equal to 3. I'm not going to talk about uh, normal subgroups, 
And the reason for this is that I think that you know, the, the general strategy is already going to be transparent in uh, trying to prove just that the commensurator of RF3 is RF3 itself, and somehow to get to the statements about normal subgroups, it's kind of adding technical layers to uh, the strategy that I'm going to uh, present now. So, in the rest of the talk, I'm going to try to present you the proof that the abstract commensurator of RF3 is <laughs> and I should say that our proof is much closer to even maths than uh, Farben and Hendel. So, uh, how, how did even maths proofs work in, in the case of many test groups? So, you are given, you are given an isomorphism between two finite index subgroups of the many test group, and you want to show that it's given by conjugation by the many test group. So the, the first thing that uh, Ivanov does is show that F sends powers of dentists <coughs> to powers of dentists. Right, and this is basically done by <coughs> characterizing algebraic dentists in terms of the centralizers, so that F has to preserve this algebraic characterization, and therefore F sends the power of the twist to a power of the twist. And if you think uh, that to a dentist there is a, a natural curve that is associated, so it tells you that you have a map sending a curve on the surface to another curve. And this map is actu actually gives you an automorphism of the curve parameters. And then even of proof that every automorphism of the curve complex is actually given by uh, an element uh, by the action of an element of the Manning class group and if you trace back what this proof tells you it, it really tells you that F was just a conjugation by this element of the Manning class group. Okay, so the key point in Ivanov's proof is that you, you have a complex, the curve complex, which is rigid in the sense that all its automorphisms all the simplicial automorphisms come from the action of the group. So, in our proof, we're also going to use the rigidity of a certain complex on which RFN or RF3 is acting. And the complex we're going to work with is what I'm going to call the non separating. Free splitting graph, which is defined in the following ways. So it's a graph, it's vertices correspond to uh, free splittings of F3 as an uh, HNN extension. So, way to decompose F3 as an HNN extension in this way, where this A is going to be a current one free factor of S. And it turns out that actually the splitting is entirely determined by the conjugacy S of this free factor. So you can view the vertices of the complex if you prefer as uh, conjugacy S's of uh, rank two free factors of S. And then you put an edge when uh, the splittings are compatible. Right, so such, you can think of such a splitting as being graph of group decomposition of F3 with one edge group with, with one edge with triple edge group. And you say that the two splittings associated to A and B are compatible if they admit a uh, common two edge group binding. Right. In other words, if you can find the decomposition of F3 as a graph of group with two edges, so just if you collapse one edge, you get this splitting, and if you collapse the other edge, you get that splitting. Okay, so that's a graph on which you have the natural action of power F3, and this graph was proved by Pundit to be rigid in the sense that 
the natural map from out of three to the simulation automorphism group of this map is an isomorphism. So th there is a series of uh, analogous statements for various graphs naturally associated to our frame. For example, right in the bottom group that the spine of our space is rigid. Uh, I and pseudo proof that the free splitting graph without the non sparadian condition is uh, also rigid, but, but this is the one we're going to work with uh, too. And so the goal, as an email of proof, is, <coughs> is the following. So you're given an isomorphism between two finite index subgroups of um, out of n, and you want to induce a automorphism. So first you need to, to define the map on, on the vertices, on the vertex side of, of, of this graph. So to do this, what you want is to show that every uh, abstract, every commensuration of our Fn is going to send the stabilizer in our F3 of such a splitting to the stabilizer of another split. Right? So first, key proposition is going to be to show that so let's say F is an isomorphism between finite index subgroups of R3. Also when I when I write N is always three. You want to show that uh, then in cubic <laughs> A, a current one, free factor of F3, then there exists the current one, free factor of F3, which is going to be unique up to conjugacy, such that F sends the stabilizer of the conjugacy class of A in our depend, or rather in page one, to the stabilizer of the conjugacy class of B in F. Right, and in this way, you're going to get the map from the vertex set of NS to its. And then you need to show that this map actually gives a uh, simplicial automorphism of the graphs and need to show that it preserves edges. So the second key ingredient is to show that if you started with two splittings that are compatible, then uh, the associated splittings in the image are also compatible. Right, so, so let me recap and uh, explain you how you prove the theorem from these two propositions. So, remember we have the inclusion of R3 inside its abstract cement waiver, where an element G simply acts by conjugation. That's going to be my notation for uh, conjugation. And then, thanks to the two propositions, we can associate to every uh, commensuration an uh, automorphism of the graph. And it's not hard to see that the composition of these maps is just the initial out of history action on NS responding. Okay, so I, I want to show, so, so I know in particular, thanks to the theorem of Pendit, that this map is an isomorphism. And I want to show that this map is an isomorphism. Right, so I already know that it's uh, onto, so I just need to show injectivity.
So let, let's do it as we do in an undergrad, undergraduate session. So I'm going to take f an isomorphism between two finite index subgroups such that the induced map is the identity, and I want to show that f is the identity. So I pick an element in H1, and I need to show that f of g is equal to g. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at how this element is acting on the graph. Right, so I, I let this element act on a point in my complex. <clears throat> so I told you that this is just the induced action of the inner automorphism associated with it. But it's not hard to see that conjugation by uh, f of g is the same as if you If you compose by, if you conjugate by g, but pre-compose and compose by f in between. And now, since f is acting trivially on the graph, this is just the action of at g, so it's g acting on this. So f of g and g act in the same way on this graph, but because the action has no kernel, this tells you that f of g is equal to g, and therefore f is the idea. Right, so really, the two propositions I wrote are really the two key statements that you need to prove in order to get that the fragment radar of how f3 is how it's. And in this talk, I'm mainly going to focus on explaining you uh, the proof of this first statement that f sends the stabilizer of the current one free factor to the stabilizer of the uh, current one free factor. If I have some time at the end, I'll give you a hint of the second, but I, I'm going to focus on the first. <coughs> okay, so what do I need? Well, I need a purely algebraic characterization of stabilizers of current one free factor. In other words, I need to say, if you have a subgroup of RF3 that satisfies a list of algebraic properties, then this implies that your subgroup is the stabilizer of the current one free factor. <coughs> and therefore, F is going to have to preserve these algebraic properties, so it's going to send the stabilizer of the current one free factor to the stabilizer of the current one free factor. Okay, so what's, what is this algebraic property that we are looking for? So, if you have a current one free factor, and you look at its stabilizer, then every element in the stabilizer induces an outer automorphism of A just by a prescription to it. Now, what is the kernel? The kernel is, and usually you know that in this way, it's automorphism of F3, which act trivially once the T on any, just by global conjugation. And what is typically an element here? Well, let's say your uh, free factor is generated by A and B. So an automorphism here is going to do nothing on A. And what is it going to do on C? Well, you can possibly send C to its inverse. But also what you can do is multiply it either on the left or on the right by a word in the factor. And that's all you can do. That's the description of all automorphisms in this group. So in particular, this group has an index 2 subgroup, the one where here you impose the Component to be plus one, which is just the direct product of two copies of given by these two bytes. Right? So it's isomorphic to a direct product of uh, two non obedient readers. Right? So the stabilizer of A has a normal subgroup which contains as a finite index subgroup a direct product of two non obedient readers. 
This is going to be our algebraic characterization of these elements. So I claim that conversely, if you have a subgroup of out of n satisfying this property, then it has to fix a current one free type. Let H be the subgroup of our F3 and assume that H contains a normal subgroup K which has a finite index subgroup that is isomorphic to uh, the product of two non abelian free groups. <coughs> So then, I think that H has a finite index subgroup that fixes the conjugation class of a current quantum free factor. And roughly the ID to prove this is that, so out of three and its subgroups have many actions on nice hyperbolic complexes. Now, on the other hand, a direct product acts very badly on hyperbolic complexes. So we're going to use the fact that you almost have this normal direct product to see that, in a sense, the action on H on all these hyperbolic complexes has to be elementary. And this is going to impose that you fix the free factor. That, that's the, the general strategy. Let H act on uh, hyperbolic complexes, and uh, you get a problem from uh, the fact that you have this uh, direct product sitting inside H. Okay. This more precisely, so we know that uh, out of three points H acts on um, the free factor complex or the free factor graph, which uh, is the graph defined in the following way. Its vertices are conjugacy classes of uh, proper free factors of the free group. And you put an edge between two conjugacy classes if uh, they have uh, representatives which are contained in one another. So the, the key fact about this graph that I'm going to use that is proved by Zvina and Fain is that it is um, hyperbolic in the sense of that. Okay, and now I'm going to use a, a very general statement about group actions on uh, hyperbolic spaces to deduce that actually the action of H is elementary and therefore H fixes a free factor. So the lemma is the following. So assume that you have a group H acting by isometries on some hyperbolic space X, and that H contains a normal subgroup which splits as a direct product. Here I'm not even making any assumptions on K1 and K2, just have a splitting as a direct product. Then one of the following holds either <coughs> H has bounded orbits. X or else one of the KIs <coughs> has a finite index subgroup that fixes a point in the ground boundary. So either H has bounded orbits or one of the KIs has a finite orbit in the boundary. 
the, the proof of this relies on the drama specification of uh, actions of groups on hyperbolic spaces. So if you have a group H acting by isometries of X, then in one, in one of the following three situations, either H has a rounded orbit, or H has a finite index subgroup that fixes a point in the boundary. And actually, in this case, you have three possible pictures. Either H does not contain any loss of atomic isometry, but fixes a point at infinity and has a sort of porosiblic action on X. Or H contains lots of drawing isometries, but they all have the same two fixed points at infinity. And the action is called lineal. And the last possibility is what is called a focal action. Is you have lots of drawing isometries in H. They all have one fixed point in common in the boundary, but the other fixed point varies. <coughs> right, in all cases, the group has a fixed point or a pair of fixed points in the boundary. And the last situation is some kind of generic situation. Uh, the action of H is non-elementary, and in particular, H contains a non-obedient free subgroup that is made of uh, lots of drawing isometries and has you know, rich dynamics of it. Okay, so how do we apply this to prove the lemma I stated. Okay, so I, I'm going to assume that no Ki has a finite orbit in the boundary. Right? But uh, what I want to prove is that H has bounded orbit. So before proving that H has bounded orbit, I'm first going to show that each of the KIs has bounded orbit. So otherwise, to so assume, for example, that K1 does not have bounded orbit, then look at Brahms specification. Since I assume that K1 is not in this case, if it doesn't have bounded orbits, then it must contain a lot of atomic isometry. Right? So otherwise, uh, to change K1 and K2, K1 contains a lot of atomic isometry. But now, since K2 centralizes phi, because you have this diamond product structure, well, K2 is going to fix the pair of fixed point at infinity of phi. And this is a contradiction, because I assume that K2 doesn't have any finite orbit in the band. Right, so this shows that both K1 and K2 have bounded orbits, and from this, it's easy to deduce that their product, and also K, has bounded orbits. And now, uh, the last step is use the fact that K is normal in H to deduce that actually H has bounded orbits. So I showed that K has bounded orbits. So, so this means that if I look at the set of all points in X, such that, well, the diameter of, of this is uh, finite. So I can choose an end so that this set is non empty. Right? There are points that are moved by K at distance at most k. What are the other properties of this set? 
Well, I claim that it has no accumulation point in the boundary, right? Because otherwise, such an accumulation point would be k invariant, which is a contradiction to the hypothesis. So you have a non-empty set with no accumulation point in the boundary, and finally, since k is normally h, you get that this set is h invariant, right? And this is because if you look at the diameter of k applied to hx, then this is by normality the same as the diameter of h kx, and since h is acting by isometers, this is the diameter of kx. So this set is not empty with no accumulation point in the boundary, and it's h invariant. Now, if you look back at Roma specification, if you have such an invariant, such an h invariant set, then the only possibility is that h has bounded orders. So the second situation is excluded, which implies that the group H has bounded orbits in the graph of vectors. And actually, this implies that H virtually fixes a product free vector of So there is something a little subtle here in this implication, which is, so here I'm stating that H has bounded orbits in the free factor graph, and here I'm stating that H has a finite orbit in the free factor graph. And it's not obvious that you can pass from one to the other because the graph of free factors is locally infinite. So, so this is actually the deep theorem, which was proved by Hendel and Moser, and I have a version of this in my thesis, which says basically that if you have a subgroup of uh, our Fn with no fully irreducible automorphism, 
then it has to virtually fix the conjugacy class of the free pair. So, so there is something hard going on here, but, but it's true that as soon as you have bounded orbits in the graph of free vectors, you have to fix the conjugacy class of the proper free vector of F3. Now, we are not done yet because I haven't told, told you that this free factor, that we call it A, has ring 2. I told you that H had to fix the conjugation class of the current one free factor. So if H, if A has ring 2, then we have a But if A has rank 1, then it means that H is a subgroup of the group of automorphisms of F3 that fix a rank 1 free factor. <coughs> and this group also <coughs> acts on a nice hyperbolic complex, which is the so called relative free factor complex. You look at the free factors of F3 relative to it. And this is also known to be hyperbolic. I work of Hendel and Moser. And then you can just repeat the same argument. You have a new action on H on a hyperbolic graph. So you're going to get that by the same argument that H has bounded orbits in this graph. And this is going to tell you that H fixes another free factor. And up to repeating this argument five or too many times, at the end, you're going to get an invariant free factor of rank 2, which concludes uh, the proof of the proposition. So it's, it's also hidden here that I'm using the fact that I'm working in rank 3. The point is, in rank 3, th so this free factor A has rank 1, and this is enough to ensure that stabilizers of relatively irrational trees are still virtually illegal. But in higher rank, it's no longer true but when you look at the free factor graph of Fn relative to Fk, where k is at least 2, it's not true that stabilizers of pointing the boundary are virtually illegal. So here we need to work more and, and give another uh, algebraic sentence that's going to distinguish stabilizers of current one free factors from stabilizers of irrational trees. But, but, so, so then there is more technical uh, things. There are some more technical things to do in, in higher range. But, but basically the, the strategy uh, the strategy is this. Okay, so this proves the proposition and therefore uh, it finishes the proof of my first proposition that my commensuration sends the stabilizer of a current one free factor to the stabilizer of a current one free factor. And then uh, the second thing we have to do is, in the same way, we give an algebraic characterization of compatibility. And therefore, we know that uh, our commensuration is going to send an edge in the non separating free splitting graph to an edge in the non separating free splitting graph, so you get an automorphism of the graph. So I'm not going to explain you the algebraic characterization of compatibility because I'm almost uh, out of time. But, so, so I'm going to stop. Thanks. Okay, so, uh,